On this edition of McDougal, herbalist David Hoffman will challenge your assumptions about natural remedies. Hello, I'm Wayne Judd. And now here's a man who challenges the assumptions of the medical establishment, Dr. John. I got challenged. I got challenged recently. You know, I try and tell people how to ch how to choose proper cookware. Right. And I was at one of the restaurants, one of the many restaurants that serve healthy food in my town of Santa Rosa, California. And somebody sat in sight next to me said, "Well, this restaurant uses aluminum pots and pans to cook your healthy food." And I was embarrassed. Because you that's not healthy. Do you use aluminum pots and pans in your home? Uh I avoid the kitchen, John. I wish you had. So you don't know what's question. in there. The, the the problem with aluminum is that um, it's a toxin to the system, and it is, I believe, the only controllable cause of Alzheimer's disease. And mm. not only do I believe it, the scientific literature is solidly behind that belief. Well, you know, I heard that just a few weeks ago, and ironically, even this very morning, as I was getting up and about. Uh, so for some odd reason, it came to my mind that business of, of uh, uh, this whole possibility with Alzheimer's. And so I looked at my deodorant, and there it was, aluminum chlorhydrate or yeah, aluminum something. Aluminum chloride, some chlorhydrate, sure. Yeah. And that was the primary ingredient that was listed. So, you know, I'm, am I going... Okay, it wasn't bit. just a deodorant, it was an antiperspirant. No, it was had. an antiperspirant, right. that's correct. Antiperspirant. It is an antiperspirant. And that's the difference, and people have to remember that as we discuss that there's a difference between deodorants, which generally don't have the aluminum, and antiperspirants, which stop the perspiration. So are you saying that, that the aluminum, I coat my armpits with aluminum to get them to quit sweating? The worst, thing, the worst bad, thing to do, Wayne, is to spray the armpits with this aluminum, have it enter through the nose. Oh. In cases of Alzheimer's diseases, disease. The worst cases of Alzheimer's disease have the lesions that are typical of Alzheimer's disease in the extension of the brain known as the olfactory lobes. Okay. And so what's believed is the most serious portal of entry into the body for aluminum, which causes the Alzheimer's disease, is through the nose into the olfactory tracts. And before that, the source of that aluminum was industrial. Now, okay and we won't see this for another 20, 30 years. Now what I suspect is they'll link it back to well-intentioned people trying to stop the perspiration but missing the armpit and hitting their nose. And breathing it. The reason we know that Alzheimer's disease is caused in part by aluminum is because of the extensive research that's been done. There really has been research. Tremendous, but you know, the message out there is it's all controversial. And of course, a lot of that message comes from the aluminum industry and those people that don't want to throw away their aluminum pots and pans. But Alzheimer's patients, they, their brains are loaded with aluminum, say, compared to patients who die of strokes. The lesions that are typical of Alzheimer's disease, they have a central core of aluminum silicate. You can't have the disease without these lesions. You can't have the lesions without aluminum silicate. Drinking water around the world and in various countries is associated with the incidence of Alzheimer's disease depending upon how much aluminum is in that drinking water, just over and over and over. So, so this is not hereditary? It's not hereditary. It's environmental. Absolutely. If my it's parents increased. get Alzheimer's, I don't have to worry about it if I avoid aluminum. In the last 13 years in California, it's increased tenfold the incidence of Alzheimer's disease because of the increased use of aluminum in the past 50, 60 years. That's terrifying. Now, you may say there's controversy here, but the one thing I want to warn you about is you don't want to be a human guinea pig that finally establishes whether or not Alzheimer's disease is caused by aluminum. Avoid that experiment, Give it up. Wayne. Okay. Just avoid the experiment. I'm convinced. After this break, David Hoffman will be here to talk about herbal medicine. Stay with us. It's, this has been a good show. You are going to... Hello. The job market is a competitive place. In today's economy, extra skills mean a better job for you. Speaking English is the skill you need for greater opportunity, more money, and a brighter future. Introducing Hello Channel, an exciting new television channel that teaches English as you watch TV. There's something for everyone, and the more you watch, the faster you'll learn. All you have to do is say hello. And uh, with us is David Hoffman. You remember David Hoffman from a few shows back. Herbal medicine is what we talked about, and uh, I couldn't get enough of it. I just right. I love the subject of herbal medicine. And I have some resentment here, and that is that I was not given this kind of uh, educational background in medical school. 
I should have been taught how to help my patients with herbal preparations. And I was left with the attitude, and it continued until I met David Hoffman and similar people who are knowledgeable in herbs. I was left with the attitude that herbs were ineffective. They're just, you know, plants, weeds, self-administered uh, self things that do little good. And the few of them that had some potency to them, they'd knock your liver out. They'd make you sick. And so I had a very bad attitude, but that attitude was instilled, and I have to guess, somewhat by purpose in me as a medical student. And uh, I think the whole population has that. David Hoffman has uh, several books out that we'll tell you about in a minute. Why is it that herbal medicine um, has gotten such a bad rap? Uh, it, you've got to remember it's only in this country. Uh, it's not a bad rap in uh, the Western medical system in general. And I'm afraid I have to conclude that it's uh, an economic political issue. It's not a scientific issue. Now, I look in the medical journals and if, if, if an herb causes uh, somebody to get, uh, say, a toxicity of the liver, one patient, even if it happens to be a contaminant of that herbal preparation, say with some powerful arthritis drug that a pharmaceutical company makes, it hits uh, the biggest medical yeah. journals with a splash story and then off into the media. One case and maybe the tens of thousands or hundreds yeah. of thousands of people that are helped by herbs, it never hits the press. But the implication here is that medicine doesn't care whether we're well or not. Is that what you're implying? Well, Surely medicine cares whether we're well. If they could do better, why don't they? Just, just for money? For money, people, the, the, the whole profession that, would sell out? There's a big difference between uh, the practice of medicine and the manufacture of medicinal substances. And I, I didn't want to imply that it was um, doctors one-on-one -on -one doctors that, that had this, this bias. It, is a uh, result of um, moving into high technology based medicine which you can really see as battlefield medicine, emergency medicine, which modern medicine does incredibly well. Mm -hmm. But in the, uh, the development of the multinational drug companies and very high technologically based uh, examination techniques, um, they just got built up an economic momentum to go for more and more and more specialization. Yeah. As well as a great marketing job with uh, all of us in the public. Yes. We, we want pills and shots. Well, let, let me give you one very specific example. You were just talking about the occasional case of liver damage, and it's an important issue. But um, to work out the relative safety of a drug, you have to have the LD50, the amount of um, the dosage which is poisonous, and then you compare that with what's called the ED50, the effective dose, uh, and then you do a risk-benefit analysis. With the FDA in a position where they're denying any efficacy to medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. If you have one case, uh, but they don't acknowledge there can be an ED50 at all, that one case means statistically this is the most poisonous thing ever. So there, there's mm -hmm. just this built-in bias, um, institutionally built-in, which has got to be overcome. And this is starting to change. But it's starting to change from a grassroots point of view. It's, it's a consumer demand for these preparations. But there's also a change within the, the medical community. Doctors there's, are prescribing this. I yeah. know you gave a talk uh, to the doctors at the hospital where I practice, and it was an overwhelming success. I thought I was mm. uh, throwing the, the sheep into the lion's den, but I knew he could handle the job. Mm. And when you left there, you left uh, some very, very well-educated physicians really wondering why they didn't get a better education in herbs. Mm. I think part of the problem is that most herbalists in this country, because of the suppression of the herbal medical schools, which used to exist, don't really have a background in science and medicine. So when they try and talk about what they know their herbs can do, the lan language can sound um, very flaky at times, if that's the right American expression. What I was doing with us, uh, the, the doctors at at your hospital was um, using examples from the literature and uh, trying to remember all the medicine I used to know so that I could c communicate in a language that was their language. And when you do that, then there's openness. They understood. Yeah. If, if you practiced uh, herbal medicine, help people for a long time. If you were going to convince, uh, say, a, a group of patients or a group of doctors that this is real, you know, real legitimate stuff that really works, what kind of problem would you treat and what kind of herb would you, you got one shot at it, David Hoffman, one shot, what, you want to make a demonstration that herbs do a lot of good. That's sounding a bit biblical, but um, <laughs> I, I would say that the real st st strong area for natural medicine in general, but especially herbal medicine, is uh, treating the degenerative diseases, not trying to treat acute life-threatening conditions. Um, just about anything in 
the digestive system and digestive system dysfunction can be addressed very rapidly with herbal medicine. How about but, uh, the indigestion? Yes, yes, but then what is indigestion? Well, heartburn. Um, I, it's yeah, heartburn. It's the heartburn, stuff that uh, they send me out to buy antacids for. Anything that the drug Tagamet can do, um, a herb called marshmallow, used at high enough dosage, will do symptomatically the same. It works in a very different way, so the blood chemistry would be different. But you can achieve um, the same re results, and actually you can achieve them faster. How about, I've heard cabbage is also good for indigestion ulcer problems. Very much. And um, bananas, I've heard too. Extract of bananas. Yes, yes. The, there's a whole range. I mean, uh, that's why I'm, I'm not able to come up with one herb, because um, that's like saying, what would a uh, really good green nutritional plant be? You know, we need a range of them. I wonder how much you could charge for bananas if you put them in a capsule. Well, have you seen those capsules of powdered beet powder, yeah. uh, beetroot? In Th that is a little bit. You know, of John, problem. this is a question that uh, we probably are coming up yeah, for we'll, a break. We'll get but I have a question about uh, how much it costs to, mm. to go herbal. And we'll answer that in just a, in just a moment. And I'll also tell you about David Hoffman's books. Uh, we'll be back with David Hoffman in, in just a minute. Hello. That's right, I said hello. I'm talking about an exciting new television channel that will change your life. My name is Ruth and I want you to be one of the first to know about Hello Channel. Hello Channel is designed to teach you to speak English. Anyone can learn. We offer something for everyone. You'll see programming for children, teenagers, and adults, all on different levels. With Hello Channel, You'll hear, see, read, and speak English as you're watching entertaining television programs, making it easy to learn. If you've always wanted to learn English but haven't had a chance, Hello Channel is perfect for you. Start today and remember, for a brighter future, just say hello. And with me is David Hoffman. David Hoffman is Professor of Integral Health at the Integral Studies Institute in San Francisco. He's also author of many books and a CD-ROM. It's called The Herbalist. You can plug this into your IBM computer or your Apple Macintosh computer and you can uh, bring up the herbs and also the problems and uh, by computer technology it'll put the two together and help you tremendously. Also a book called An Elder's Herbal, which is a practical book on uh, making plant medicine your friend. and the New Holistic Herbal, again, another practical book for people to use to identify the herbs that could be an advantage to their problems. And then for, for doctors, for people who are interested in the scientific basis of herbal medicine, he's written a, a scientific book. It's the information source book of herbal medicine. And so if you'd like to go to the original literature on this, that book will help you. Uh, you were uh, asking yes, a question uh, before I did Thank you, John. Know. David, I, I'm wondering about the economics of herbal mm -hmm. medicine. Um, can I afford it? Is it more or less expensive? Uh, will my health plan cover it as opposed to getting amitriptyline or yeah. it's the only drug yeah. that jumped into my brain at yes. the moment? But, but you, you got my question. Yeah. What's the economics? Um, confusing. Uh, this is a point where I start to lose friends in the, the herbal industry because uh, as far as I'm concerned, herbalism should be, I suppose we could say, the people's medicine. Mm -hmm. If you know the plants, you can pick them. If you don't know the plant, don't pick them, right. just in case. Right. Um, in states where naturopathic medicine is licensed, and California is not one of them, but in the states where it is, um, then if the herbs are prescribed by a naturopathic physician, then they can be covered by, by insurance. Um, there are ways of uh, using herbs so that it is really quite cheap compared to the real costs of drug medicine. However, if your prescription is covered by insurance and the cost of herbal tinctures isn't, then that's, it will look like the herbs are more expensive. How about if you grow them in your garden? You can do that? Yeah, and you don't even have to pay PG&E, it's let me, free. Yeah, let me talk to you about some specific things that always come to me. How about treating uh, female hormones, like hormone problems like PMS with herbal medicine? Mm. Um, 
very successful when you when the right herbs are used and unfortunately most of the products that I've seen on the market which are herbal PMS treatments don't have the right herbs in them you know they're, they're simply um, water removal mm -hmm. uh, approaches there's a herb called skullcap which um, I should explain the name it's called skullcap because of the medieval European academics well, funny little caps on the top of their head. The top of the flower looks like one of those, if you're mm. a botanist. Um, that, that plant is amazing at changing the psychological symptoms of PMS. It doesn't remove PMS, it just changes it into um, a more positive state. For uh, ongoing problems, if this happens every month, then Vitex used every day um, over two or three months will usually calm down the um, the ups and downs. And then the, if there is cramping, um, dysmenorrhea, there's a plant called cramp bark. Cramp bark, that was cramp. convenient. Yes, well, um, if anybody knows botany, um, you look at the Latin names of most of the plants, they're named after their medical use. Hmm. Um, so cramp bark there's a whole There's a whole subject of medicine, plant medicine, that's getting a lot of attention, and that's uh, uh, phytoestrogens, uh, mm. plant hormones, and they, they speak of yams, and they speak of soybeans, and it's, it's not quite herbal, but it's still in the plant oh, kingdom yeah, that we're talking yeah. about. Um, this is a very confused and confusing area. A phytoestrogen does not mean that a plant has estrogen in it. It means it has constituents which will trigger off estrogen receptor sites sometimes. Now, most of the things which are called phytoestrogens are things called isoflavones, which means they're related to the the chemicals which make leaves change color in mm -hmm. the fall. And um, they work by part of their shape of the molecule being similar to part of the estrogen shape. So they fit in receptor sites, but they don't have estrogenic effects per se. The, the strongest source of these, uh, the richest source, I should say, are soybeans. Now, if soybeans really did have an estrogenic effect, I mean, just, it just might sound a bit silly, there wouldn't be a population explosion in China. Yeah. Uh, because they eat a lot of tofu, the men eat a lot of tofu, if it really was estrogenic, their fertility would go down. So the word being used carries the connotation that we're getting estrogen. But it does have an effect on a woman's menstrual very, cycle. Very, definitely. So it's, very definitely. But it's, it's a subtle, gentle one. It's a gentle one which protects women from breast cancer before menopause. Yes. Then after menopause, they say that uh, people in eastern countries that eat lots of rice and beans and soybeans, they don't have menopausal symptoms. They don't have hot flashes. Have you heard that? I've heard that. I'm, I, I want more evidence before I, I completely embrace that one. I, I wonder partially whether there's also cultural issues. I, I wouldn't want to see um, um, menstrual issues or menopausal issues purely pharmacologically. Um, culturally, this is not really a very sane culture to be a woman in. Women are, are really given a hard time in all sorts of uh, roles they have to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder whether um, menopause is as uncomfortable as, as it is because it's social roles. You and I will never change. know, will we? No. Well, no. We'll, just have to, we'll just have to leave it to people to tell us. If the herbal issues confuse you a bit, there's a way to straighten it out. Uh, David Hoffman has written several books. He has uh, the new Holistic Herbal, which is a very practical book. Also, an elder's herbal, and uh, it's a way that you can go to the herb and to your problems and uh, sort them out. And if you have an, a computer, IBM or Apple, in your computer store is the herbalist that you can buy. We'll be back in a minute with our special guest, David Hoffman. Watch TV and learn English at the same time on Hello Channel. Hey Dad, can you come out and shoot some hoops with me? Busy. Studies show that by the time I'm 12, I can be influenced by friends more than parents. Give your family everything. Give them your time. And with us is David Hoffman. He's a very practical man, and herbal medicine is his specialty. David, I have a question for mm. you. Um, before our break, we were talking about uh, the the good fortune other countries and cultures have. What uh, concerted or organized effort uh, do we see in the medical community or in the herbal community to actually tap into those kinds of resources? I mean, are we just, uh, again, sometimes I, I sense that America is the, 
we, we have it all and we know it all, but are we reaching out and connecting so that we can grow and learn through? Well, you know, actually, in terms of the uh, worldwide herbal community, there's actually been suggestions that there should be um, medical herbalists sent as a sort of missionary task to um, help the poor Americans <laughs> who, who are lacking Project in this. Hope. Um, there's Project the, Herb. <laughs> the, the World Health Organization funds something called the, uh, the Traditional Medicines Program, which is looking at ways in which um, indigenous traditional, usually herbal approaches, can be um, linked in with Western Orthodox medicine. Mm -hmm. And incredible work's being done on that. Oh, there's tremendous. only one country in the world where that doesn't happen, and that's here. Interesting. Well, we have, uh, we have the pharmaceutical companies yes. that make up for all that. Yes. How about uh, the, we hear a lot about herbs, and the household word is ginseng. How about ginseng as, as, as the tonic for youth, the tonic for, um, well, anything you would want, I guess. Well, there are, gin, there are lots of different ginsengs, which is one of the confusing issues here. Ginseng belongs to a category of uh, plant actions called adaptogens, which um, help you cope and deal with stress. Uh, and they're very, very useful, um, but you can only use them so far. What we Westerners tend to do is when something good comes along, we use it to its limits, and then we need mm -hmm. something else to help us. Um, ginseng really comes into its own when it's used as a way of coping with stressful situations, changing the stress, and removing it. Uh, mm -hmm. If ginseng is just used regularly um, to work harder, do more, then, you know, a collapse is going to come eventually. The plant which I recommend, uh, rather than Panax ginseng, the one that is so well known, is something called Siberian ginseng. Uh, ordinary ginseng can overstimulate some people. It's, it's not uncommon to get headaches. Siberian ginseng doesn't cause any of those problems, and it's a lot cheaper. But how can you tell whether you've got real ginseng, whether you've got the proper dose? And this applies to yeah. all herbs. I mean, it, the, the consumer um, beware out there, I suppose. Yeah, and this is why the FDA is essential, I'm afraid to say. Um, so you're in favor of uh, sort of regulation? Because the, uh, the marketplace has really shown that it, it can't police itself properly. There are some excellent herb companies, but there are some, some really dubious organizations. There is a really important role for the FDA. However, what it's doing at the moment um, makes no sense whatsoever. But there, there is an important need for regulation. Uh, uh, once you get it back into that realm, though, face it, David, aren't we again looking at um, uh, commercializing this thing to the extent that it's just going to become another ripoff once we find it's better than the, maybe the pharmaceuticals will move toward herbs and, and capture the market and we'll... They can't patent them. No, but they can patent uh, mixtures and combinations. Yes, it's a really, it's a concern. It's a real concern. Um, you have to bear in mind that all of the big drug companies, other than the genetic engineering ones, they all started as uh, herbal product companies in the last century. Interesting. Well, I and guess I'm just skeptical that herbalists are going to be any any nicer than, than pharmacies. Is that bad? I no, no, it's, it's a good question. Economics seems to drive everything. They're, one of the real saving graces of herbalism is that um, most of the people in it are in it because they love it, not because um, they're in it to they're make They're good money. people. They're supposed yes. to, we think of you as being a good person because this well, is what you do. Mm -hmm. I'm maybe, no comment maybe on that Maybe one, when so it comes to care nothing for the money, money make it bad. Yeah, but a lot of the herbal companies are choosing not to grow. They're choosing to be very regional, very local, and just producing good quality products for the, the local market. And I think that's, that's the saving grace to avoid the trap that One you One quick see. last question. You think herbal medicine is going to become more and more popular? Yes. Yes. It's, um, I do a lot of uh, teaching around the country, and interest is just skyrocketing. Thank you, David Hoffman. Always a fascinating subject. Happy to be here. Until next time, stay healthy and happy. Very good.